Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the virtual kickoff for the Grassland Resilience Workshop Series on Brush Management and Soil Health. This workshop series is a product of a collaboration between CART, the Conservation and Adaptation Resource Toolbox, the Altar Valley Conservation Alliance, the Santa Rita Experimental Range, the USDS Agricultural Resource Service, Research Service, and Cienega Watershed Partnership with funding from Elise Gornish's lab. The idea for this workshop series came from CART's grassland community of practice that began uh, after an in-person workshop focused on grassland research and management in 2019. Brush management and soil health were two of the main priorities that participants identified during this workshop and that CART's community of practice was launched, was launched to respond to in the form of peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing to help address brush management, soil erosion, soil health, and a number of other priority issues. Since 2019, uh, as a community, we've learned a lot about how to address brush management and soil health issues that arise in grasslands. And this workshop series is an opportunity to join together as a community and share what's been learned over the years and identify remaining questions and priority areas to tackle. The goal of this workshop series is to bring together land managers ranchers and researchers to learn about standard management practices that have been developed in three adjacent watersheds in southeastern Arizona to improve soil health and manage mesquite encroachment. This will help improve understanding of why outcomes of management practices differ, how to transfer success across regions facing mesquite encroachment and soil degradation, and document the effects of these management practices on natural resources of concern, including soil, vegetation, and wildlife. My name is Ariel and I'm uh, CART's Grassland Community of Practice Coordinator. I'm based out of the University of Arizona in Tucson and Carly Jewell from Fish and Wildlife Service Science Applications is here with me today and will be helping facilitate the webinar. We're gonna be hearing from Brett Bloom, Julia Guglielmo and Scott Jones today. Each of the speakers will give an overview of the watersheds they work in to set the stage for upcoming field visits. Again, we encourage you to register for these field visits using the webinar, the webinar flyer, which is in the chat, and we'll send out after the webinar as well. As the speakers present, we encourage you to please write any questions directly in the chat. We'll try to keep track of those during the webinar and uh, work with the panelists to address them during the Q&A and panel discussion at the end. And without further ado, uh, I'll introduce our three speakers and then pass it over to them for the presentations. So Brett Bloom is the director for the Southern Arizona Experiment Station, part of the University of Arizona's land grant. This role includes the administration and management of the Santa Rita Experimental Range, America's oldest experimental range. His career fo focus is to provide a diverse platform for research, education, and outreach with an emphasis on understanding ecological processes and refining agricultural practices in the desert Southwest. He holds a master's and bachelor's of science in wildlife ecology, conservation and management from the University of Arizona, with much of his research focused on human wildlife interactions and the social dimensions of natural resources. Brett is an Arizona native and, and spends much of his free time exploring the backcountry of the Southwest. Julia Guglielmo has been working with the Altar Valley Conservation Alliance since 2018. The Alta Valley Conservation Alliance is a landowner-led organization that works across boundaries to conserve the Altar Valley through a strongly collaborative, science-based, community-driven approach. Julia has designed, implemented, and monitored projects on grassland restoration, soil health, watershed rehabilitation, wildlife connectivity, and other landscape-level issues. She holds a Bachelor's of Arts in Environmental Studies from the University of Michigan and a Master of Science in Natural Resources from the University of Arizona. And Scott Jones is an assistant professor of practice at the University of Arizona in the School of Natural Resources and the Environment. His research interests are in landscape ecology, socio-ecological systems, ecosystem services, and land use land cover. He earned his PhD at the University of Arizona, where his work focused on the rates and dynamics of shrub encroachment across La Cienegas National Conservation Area and its impacts on ecosystem services and functions. Um, and with that, I'll pass it to our three wonderful speakers, a virtual round of applause already for the three of you. And um, I'll pass it to Julia and Scott to kick it off. Yeah, so hi, I'm Scott Jones. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Ariel. 
And we'll start off this talk by giving a real quick overview by, about brush uh, treatments, brush management, um, and soil health. Uh, and then from that, we'll spin off into each of us giving a short 10 to 15 minute presentation on one of the individual sites, um, the Santa Rita, Altar Valley, and La Cienegas, and the brush management that's going on out there. So I thought I'd start this uh, talk off by quickly giving a brief overview of shrub encroachment. So starting about 150 years ago, one of the most dramatic shifts on rangelands has been uh, the encroachment of unpalatable woody plants at the expense of perennial grasses. So if you look here, this is a photo from Santa Rita in 1902, looking out and those dark blobs you see on the uh, landscape are mesquite. So if you fast forward to 2018, uh, this system has basically shifted to a mesquite dominated system at this point. Um, you can see the extent um, and the intensity of the encroachment in these areas. And this is not just something that is confined to Arizona, Southern Arizona, or the United States. It's actually a global issue. Um, and most continents have actually shown documented uh, invasion of shrubs into grasslands and rangelands. So here in southern Arizona, our uh, most predominant invader is uh, Prosopis volutna, or uh, velvet mesquite, and here's a picture of it here. It's actually a pretty, uh, pretty successful invader due to a number of reasons. One, it has a very deep taproot that allows it to have access to water most of the year, allowing it to be pretty drought resistant. Um, it's a prolific seed producer. And those seeds tend to be tasty, so things like to disperse them across the landscape, allowing it to move into areas that it currently is not. And it is a re-sprouter, so that makes it very resistant to disturbances. Um, you can knock these guys down, and they will re-sprout unless that crown root area has been disturbed. In fact, this uh, prosopis has actually been termed as through one paper as the world's worst uh, woody invaded plant taxa. So we're lucky enough to have it here in Arizona. So what's driving shrub encroachment? It is a very diverse uh, and complex issue that I think Brett will talk into a little more detail in the Santa Rita presentation, but uh, it is a complex interaction between grazing, fire, disturbance, um, and changes in climate and drought. But once shrubs invade on the landscape, that has a number of different consequences to the area, whether that's changing habitat for grassland obligate species into more woody dominated species. Um, this can affect forage production in some cases, uh, open up areas, especially in arid and hyper arid regions, open up areas for more uh, bare ground leading to more erosion from wind and water. Um, and it can just have a number of different er other consequences, such as changing the albedo or the surface roughness of the area. So the consequences of this um, are diverse. And because of that, starting in about 1940, people started to realize that encroaching shrubs on the landscape were a problem. So they started to actively manage and control these through processes we call as brush management. Um, these fall mainly into four categories. You have chemical treatments, uh, prescribed fires or prescribed burns, or pyric treatments, and then you also have mechanical treatments. And we'll dive into these, into the specific use uh, in our individual conversations. I think what's important to realize with this though, um, is that brush management tends to be extremely expensive, whether that's money or resources, manpower intensive. Um, and these treatments are finding out, we're finding out that once you knock down these woody dominated systems back to a grass system, they tend to re-encroach back in um, and without repeated treatment over time, your efforts are pretty useless as, you know, you may have a 10 to 15 year period where you have this grass system that's great, but it will eventually be re-dominated or re-encroached by shrubby, uh, woody cover. Um, an example of this re-encroachment, so here's Buenos Aires National Wildlife Refuge that conducted around 2021 um, a mastication project. So basically it took this big piece of machinery here and they drove it over the landscape. And when they got to a mesquite, they lifted that big heavy equipment and ground it down to the stump to ground level. Um, so this is, I think, a couple of weeks after the process was done and you can see it's fairly open. Um, and this is fast forward to one year. You can see the re-sprout ability of mesquite on the landscape. So within one year, uh, most of these mesquites were not killed through this process and they're already beginning to 
uh, re-encroach or regrow on the landscape. So without an active management process here to go in and re-knock down these saplings or these, these sprouts, um, your system would return to what it looked like prior to the management. So the reasons for brush management are diverse, and you'll kind of get a snippet of this in each one of our presentations, but uh, I thought I'd highlight some of them. Like in Las Cienegas, you're really working on a multiple use landscape. So you're managing not only for recreation and wildlife, but also for the active grazing operation that is occurring there. Um, and then in situations like Altar Valley, uh, you have a mix of private and public land that are engaging in these management processes. So it's looking at livestock operations, how that can impact it, um, as well as increasing corridors for wildlife species. And then in the Santa Rita, uh, it was initially used uh, as a way to increase forage production for livestock, but this has been transitioning more into wildlife goals um, and increasing fuel loads to carry uh, fires as well as supporting ranching operations. So what is possible and what isn't possible with brush management? Well, we don't really know a lot of the long-term efficacy of using these processes. We do know uh, from sites that you can decrease the size of mesquite on the landscape. And through that, you can directly kill some of those mesquites. Um, and through that, you can also change habitat conditions for wildlife. So this is commonly seen with pronghorn. When you open up an area free of mesquite, uh, pronghorn tends to occupy that area within the year once it's opened up. Um, you can modify fuel conditions to allow for more grass in some situations to help carry fuels or fires, um, and you can decrease bare ground in some situations. Um, this is very dependent on uh, the site you're treating and the conditions and the variables uh, of that site. There's also a ton of unknowns that we don't know, such as the long-term efficacy. We don't know if how long it will take with these repeated management actions to return the system to maybe a self-sustained uh, biodiverse grassland. We don't know if that's even possible without the reintroduction of fire. Um, so could we treat up to a point and then will the system retake over and self-sustain as a grassland or are these just continual treatments that we need to do? Um, we don't know if it really is increasing ground cover in all situations. And I'll put up this picture here from uh, Archer et al. in 2011. So on the x-axis, you can see years after brush treatment. And this is a synthesis of a bunch of different brush management projects. And then uh, on the other side, you have herbaceous biomass change. So you can see right after these brush management treatments, you tend to see an increase in herbaceous biomass. But by year six or seven, it tends to return back to the normal levels you had pre-treatment. Um, and you also have some sites that actually see a decrease in this herbaceous biomass. So this is very dependent on the site. Again, we don't know if this will always reduce soil erosion. Um, sometimes mesquites act as a island of fertility for native plants and removing them may actually lead to more bare ground or larger clumps of invasives or unwanted grasses. Um, yeah, and we don't know really the effects that it's having on soil communities to an extent. So when choosing to, to engage in these brush management, there's a number of things you need to consider. And I think personally, and this is what my research has looked at, is the topoadaptic characteristics of that site. So what's the soil type it's on? Uh, what's the elevation or slope? What's the water holding capability here? And these will all influence the percent of shrub that will be on the landscape and how fast it will re-encroach. And I'll talk about this when we talk when I uh, give my presentation on Las Cienegas. Um, also, the current conditions of the site will really dictate what type of brush management treatments you can engage in. You know, this this area right here, those shrubs are very large, so you could not go out with a backpack sprayer and apply herbicide to it and expect that to work. Um, and again, also, depending on the type of landscape you're on, if it's a private land or is it uh, public land, that'll really constrain the type of treatments you can use. You know, diesel has been shown to be a very effective killer of mesquite, but that is not permitted on public lands, but that is still able to be used on private lands. Um, also, timing of treatment. Uh, we'll explore this a little more in our individual talks, but, you know, some things to consider is with herbicide, you really need to time this up with the, the phenology of mesquite. If it's too warm, those stomates will not be open. Therefore, the application of herbicide will not be uptaken by the plant, and you tend to get low kill. Um, also, wind, if it's too windy, you know, your applications of herbicide can be blown all over the place undesirably. 
Um, and then with like something like prescribed fire, you need to have exact climatic conditions to carry these fires, and you also need to have enough fuel. And then also after these treatments, it's really important to understand, you know, is there going to be rain? I'm opening up large areas of bare ground. Is it going to rain? Am I reseeding these areas? Will grass actually regrow on these locations? And again, you know, all these treatments, I really want to highlight need follow-up maintenance. Um, these red arrows here are pointing to uh, re-encroaching or re-sprouting shrubs. So this was mechanically treated at La Cienegas in 2020 or in 2010 about. This is 10 years later, this photo is taken. You can see within 10 years, uh, there's a prominent amount of small mesquite on the landscape. So with that, I'll turn it over to Julia for a couple more points. Thanks, Scott. So yeah, I would say that 10 years after treatment is um, really fortunate that you wouldn't have to treat um, for another 10 years after treatment. A lot of times you need to treat within just a couple of years after the initial treatment. And what we found kind of across the region is to retreat before the mosquito mature. So having a small diameter trunk or trunks um, and being young so that they're more vulnerable to attack is really important than mesquite that are mature or harder to knock down. Um, and then just noting some potential combinations across the region that we've been seeing that seem to be working. And when you say working, it's really are the mesquite being knocked down, not necessarily all the treatment goals, but what's actually keeping the mesquite down? Um, grubbing followed by more grubbing. Grubbing plus herbicide when the mesquite are young. Um, backpack herbicide, so ground-based and spraying each individual tree and doing that multiple times. We've also done aerial herbicide sprayed from a helicopter, and then you follow it up with a spot treatment of the individual trees. There's also been fire followed by grubbing. These are just some examples of the treatment combinations that have been working that we'll see on some field trips. Go ahead, Scott. And then we wanted to just touch on monitoring because with maintenance has to come monitoring of the areas. Um, monitoring is not very standardized across our region and it's done in a very spotty way. There aren't a lot of um, common protocols that are used across the landscape and different land ownerships particularly because different places have different protocols um, with the agencies or private ownerships who are managing the land. So ones that are used commonly include line point intercept, kind of establishing transects and looking at the vegetation frequency and composition along those lines, looking at how much of the mesquite cover has live canopy. So how much of those leaves are dying and how many are coming back can be a really good indicator, of course, of whether they're alive or dead on the way out or not. Um, tree size age, that's really important for follow-up treatments to see if um, you will be able to do it pretty easily, but also just to see, of course, if the trees are growing um, more over time. And then photos is probably the most common and seems to be kind of the most impactful as far as convincing people to do brush treatments or not and seeing what's happening on the landscape. That's kind of the easiest method to do. Um, and then there's kind of tangential monitoring to see if you've reached your goals. One is whether the area is being utilized by wildlife, livestock, whatever species you're managing for. And then you can also couple the monitoring with like precipitation and temperature data to see what factors might have influenced the response to the treatment. As far as the connections to soils, this workshop's going to be really exciting because soils seem to be a little bit of a nebulous and mysterious topic as far as vegetation treatments go, what to monitor, um, with your vegetation treatment and some questions or potential ways to monitor the soils before and after treatments are the soil microbial community. So what is actually in the soil? Um, there's models out there that you can see the volume of soil that might be retained or lost at the site. And then you can also ask what vegetation species are present on the site and what they indicate about the soils. But I would say that for monitoring, there haven't been a ton of sites where soils have been monitoring 
um, in conjunction with the brush treatment. So that'll be a great thing to discuss during this workshop. Next slide. And then some remaining questions like I was just going into that we can really start exploring through this series. What are the impacts of mesquite treatments on soil health? What has the actual direct taking out of the mesquite done for the soil hydrology, soil community, soil volume? What has come back as a result of the treatment or not as a result of the treatment? Um, also another question is, what to do with the remaining mesquite after you treat it. A lot of people pile it up into brush piles. They might burn them. Um, some people don't pile them up at all. It's left on the landscape. Um, there's other treatments where there's just standing dead mesquite. Um, and what is the value for that of the ecosystem? Um, there's a lot of uh, very valuable ways to use mesquite. And so it might be good to get creative with how to utilize that. And then another really big question is, are mesquite treatments even worth it? They're really costly. They take a really long time to maintain. And really, they're just endless upkeep of these areas that we're trying to maintain as really high quality grassland. So where is it worth it? Where is it worth putting the resources into? And what have we accomplished through each different type of treatment? And then the other question, as I was discussing before, was just how to monitor across the different treatment areas. This workshop is a great opportunity to put our heads together about how we're monitoring in different areas and what are the most meaningful, biggest bang for the buck um, ways that we can monitor without spending a ton of money and time. Next slide. So as we transition into thinking about the field trips, we also wanted to pose to all of you you know, we're going to be seeing landscapes like this, where it was a recent brush treatment. And I think a lot of people, when they would see a picture like this, they would say, oh, this looks great. The mesquite are pretty much gone. There's some brush piles in the distance. There's grass there. It looks great. But really, as a manager of these lands, when you look at it, you also say, what is that understory? Who's using it? Who can utilize this landscape? And what's it going to look like to keep it looking this way or similar to this? It's going to take a lot more money and time and effort to keep it looking like this. So I think there's a lot more than meets the eye with brush treatments. And those are some of the things that we can really explore more in the field. And that's it for the overview presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Julia and Scott. Um, some great questions in the chat. We'll get the, a little bit more exploration of those in the Q&A. Keep them coming. Um, and we will pass it on to Brett for a presentation about the Santa Rita Experiments and Range. All right. Good morning, everybody. Can everybody see my screen and hear me OK? Yep. Sounds good. All right. Well, appreciate the introduction by everybody. Great job, Scott and Julia. And some of this will be a little redundant, but in a way that I think will kind of reinforce the complexity of the way that these systems operate. So <clears throat> the intent of this presentation is one, just the precursor for the upcoming field trip on the Santa Rita, the same as we'll have for Altar and Las Cienegas, and also to paint a more comprehensive picture of this change over time and what some of these drivers of mesquite have been, and bring that forward to what is a more contemporary, both recognition and uh, methodology of how we can actually apply treatments in a way that's going to be fine-tuned and case-specific. So with that, going way back into the late 1800s, it won't come as a surprise to anybody that livestock and cattle was a driving economic force in Arizona. Um, cattle is one of the five C's of Arizona. And by the 1890s, there really was, there really was not much of a, an understanding of and ecological balance at this time. We're coming off of Manifest Destiny, and the idea that resources were somehow exhaustible hadn't really taken root in the American psyche. And so that mentality was then confronted with reality of essentially a highly variable southwestern climate. And so in the early 1890s, there was an elevated stocking rate that met what was at the time a fairly catastrophic drought what by today's standards we would just call a drought. Um, but the combination of 
too many cattle on the landscape combined with the degradation of available forage, lack of regeneration of forage, changes in soil dynamics, et cetera, led to what was about a 50% die off of the total livestock population in Arizona at the time and uh, between Pima, Santa Cruz, Cochise, and Pinal counties. As a result of all of this change, um, there was a whole new dynamic and period of succession that began to take root. New observations on the landscape, including things like observations of head cuts, channeling, um, loss of topsoil, et cetera, not just on the Santa Rita, but regionally. And so this is a picture taken from New Mexico. Um, very briefly, as a result of all of this, in combination of recognition by multiple parties, the Santa Rita Forest Reserve, what is today the Santa Rita Experimental Range, was established by President Theodore Roosevelt in 1902. Uh, as the quote says, its purpose was expressly understood to be the study of grazing range problems with a view, if possible, to a demonstration on a large and convincing plan for range restoration and control. So essentially, this was a recognition that we needed to have a more comprehensive understanding of how rangeland ecosystems operate. And at the time, livestock was the driving factor therein. So for context and where we are talking, uh, the Santa Rita Experimental Range is about 52,000 acres located just east of the Santa Cruz River. Um, and here it is in relation to both the Altar Valley and the La Cienegas for uh, both Julie and Scott will be presenting on. So within the SRER um, composition is really three primary ecotypes. The lower elevations are like true snow and desert snow and upland. Mid elevation is a mesquite savanna. Notice that we don't say it's a grassland, but it is a savanna. That's going to be a critical point later on. And then the higher elevations are more of a true oak woodland. So very early on, as I had mentioned in this, there's a recognition that the landscape as it was was no longer the landscape that people were starting. You know, that landscape was now in a period of transition following the late 1890s in combination with overstocking and drought. And so with the new Santa Rita Experimental Range, David Griffiths was appointed as the first origin, as the first full-time researcher on the Santa Rita. And his mandate was to figure out a fixed stocking rate. So essentially how many head of livestock can an area or a single acre of land sustain for what period of time? So today that concept is kind of laughable um, by our standard. We know that it's not that simple, but bear in mind that this is the first you know, really the first segue into um, developing a more comprehensive understanding of how these ecosystems work. And so there's another quote here that says, in a region where the seasons, altitude, slope, and rainfall are also variable. So hang on to that quote. That's really a recognition by Griffiths that it's not that simple. We can't just figure out how many head of livestock an acre of the southern end of the range will hold compared to the northern end. There's too many variables at play. So to give you an idea of some of this change over time that was being documented, here we see a photo just after the establishment of the Santa Rita in 1902. Here's the same in 2019, similar to the photos that Scott had shown before. And then here we can see that change over time into the 50s, the 70s, and then the early 2000s. So same photo series as Scott had shown, looking from the top of Werfano Butte, we can see largely... Um, open grassland with most of the woody species relegated to the desert washes as we'd find in a more natural and balanced system. A lot of these are actually hackberries and graythorn and things of that nature, and really not a high density of mesquites at this time, whereas here it's almost mesquite, ubiquitous with mesquite, with some of those hackberries still being relegated to these washes. And so what this graph shows here is coming off of a long period of consistent mesquite treatment from the 1930s to the early 1970s. And you can see that the canopy cover was inherently lower during these treatments, but it wasn't necessarily cost effective to be able to maintain those. So there is this continued increase up into the early 1990s. And then as a result of both changes in precipitation patterns, temperature and density dependent factors, we've really reached like a point of stability where the canopy cover has not changed fundamentally on the range in about the last 30 years. So some of the drivers of this mesquite encroachment um, as all things, it'd be really nice if there was like a single mode for this, but it's very complicated and multifactorial. So one of the driving factors would be livestock as a vector for seed dispersal. And so these mesquites that were otherwise relegated to these desert washes, now the presence of livestock in that environment is uh, they're able to disperse the seeds far and wide outside of those typical washes. 
um, the combination of livestock and also small mammals, things like pack rats, etc. So the seeds are distributed much more broadly on the landscape than they would have been in a traditional system. That's also combined with changes in soil biology and hydrology. So as a result of overgrazing, some of the topsoil is lost. Mesquites are better able to establish themselves because there's not competition from other native species. This is also in combination with fire suppression. So we were coming at a time where any fire on the landscape was a bad fire. It burned grass, it burned forage, timber resources, et cetera. And so there just wasn't that much to burn on the landscape, frankly, for the first 20, 30 years of the Santa Rita's existence. And any fire that did crop up was snuffed out fairly quickly. And so as a result, these small sapling mesquites that would typically burn in a natural fire system were then able to establish themselves to a point where when a fire did come through, those mesquites were then fire tolerant and able to persist. Um, Long-term changes in seasonal temperatures are another driver, just hotter, drier systems, which leads me to a much more variable precipitation pattern. And these are bimodal precipitation patterns. So anyone in the desert Southwest recognizes we have a winter precipitation pattern and we have our summer monsoons. And that where we are today really is very dynamic. It's not nearly as predictable as it used to be. If there is a trend in this, it's that our winter precipitation that's much more um, much more far reaching, I guess you could say, and able to saturate the landscape with long, slow winter storms, that's much more infrequent and tends to be drier in general. Whereas our summer storms are highly, highly variable. And so within the last four years, we're coming off two of the wettest years on record and two of the driest years on record, back to back to back and all of this. So that fluctuation in seasonal precipitation is another variable that's also a contender for some of these drivers. As far as control methods, um, as I mentioned, there was a concerted effort from the 1930s to the 1970s really to get a handle on mesquite in particular, other woody species, burrow weed, etc., um, which also have kind of boom and bust cycles on the range. But the idea with this is habitat management, as Scott had or as Scott had mentioned, but also really focusing on more grass on the landscape is better for livestock. We recognize today that it is more complicated than just producing grass, as Julia mentioned in her slide, that there does need to be a combination of factors within this. But regardless, on the Santa Rita alone, there were treatments of hand cutting, grubbing, chaining, pushing, fire, any number of herbicide treatments that you can imagine, both on the ground and aerial applications, adjustments to the pH of the soil, the alkalinity of the soil, and a variety of combinations of, of all of the above. And as you can see, um, we're not talking about this as a long-term success story of how we figured out and we unlocked the mystery of brush management. We, we haven't. Um, <laughs> we've learned a lot about what might work and we've learned about methodologies that are maybe less effective, but it's a much more dynamic system within all of that. And so in spite of all of the treatment, it was able to keep a lid on some of the growth for a long time, but the cost didn't the cost did not, the benefits did not weigh the costs, I should say. And so again, looking at 2007 and on, we can see that there's roughly 30 to 40% mesquite cover over much of the mid elevation. At the same time, there's additional takeaways that there were areas that were treated that seemed to stick or didn't exhibit the same level of change in brush encroachment as the bulk of the rest of the range. And so this is an area on the Santa Rita looking towards pasture one, so towards Box Canyon, for any of you that are familiar here with the range, here it is following treatment two years later in 1955. And we can see that there's this big square cut out here and then some additional treatment along the foothills here off of Sawmill Canyon. And looking at that today, we can see that the system is still fairly open. Here's some other examples in our 12 pastures near the mouth of Madera Canyon, relatively open 1908. Here we are in 2019, similar system. Pasture one again, 1948, 2019. Um, this is analogous to the same photo that Julia had shown. It's essentially a layman's monoculture out here, but it is open and it is less woody and less overall canopy covered from mesquite. So the reason for this is multifactorial. There are, there's extreme variation just on the Santa Rita. There's heterogeneity on the south end of the Santa Rita versus the north end. There is heterogeneity between the lower elevations 
here and the Sonoran Upland versus the higher elevations near the foothills of the San Rita. There are variables at play and change over time, both seasonally. So winter precipitation versus spring and summer again, as well as longer term variation where we have the same pasture here in April 2000 and fairly high density of uh, forage. And again, mostly layman's, but still high density of grass and um, a variety of different species. And then we have the same, roughly the same time of year, late spring in 2007, following back-to-back -back dry years. And there's almost no re regeneration of both spring annuals and summer annuals on that landscape. As I mentioned, variation in precipitation patterns compared to the long-term average. Here is precipitation in 2019, um, summer precipitation, and then the same darker values here in 2020. This is a graph through ARS provided by Russ Scott that shows the carbon uptake as a result of a direct result of monsoon precipitation, essentially how much greenness is there on the range? What is the amount of new generation and new growth, not just through mesquite, but generation of grass, et cetera? And what does that mean for carbon uptake and then carbon exchange within the atmosphere as a result of precipitation? So here we are in 2020-22, what was a very wet year, and here we are to date in 2023, which was almost an average year for the range compared to the rest of Arizona, and here it is in relation to the long-term average. So highlighting variables, and one of the primary drivers in this is soil. So going back to some of the photos that we had looked at of why did some of these treatments stick in different regions on the range while others have a 25-year life cycle where you can completely eradicate mesquite from the landscape 25 years later it's like you were never there if they're left untreated what is the difference in that and what we have found is that soil type and composition is a primary driver of mesquite composition at least on the range and so back to pasture one where it was treated in the 50s and that seemed to stick it's essentially the same soil type and same composition as what we're looking here in this alluvial fan from Madera Canyon, where we have these clay rich Paleocene soils. And then just across the Florida wash, the watershed changes, soil type is different, and it's much more conducive to the long term cultivation of mesquite. And so, understanding those dynamics, understanding the seasonal variation within that ecosystem, understanding the uh, topography, understanding the soil types what it means for longer term precipitation trends, and overall what your objectives are, are all critical drivers of mesquite treatment. That again, as Scott had mentioned, it is incredibly expensive to be able to treat mesquite at scale. To do something on a landscape scale requires retreatment, followed up with more retreatment and more retreatment. And at the end of the day, we don't know if it works. We don't know if we can restore a system to the point where it is self-sustaining. No one has actually gotten that far with this yet. And so what we on the Santa Rita are trying to do now is partner with and learn from some of the applications in the Altar and La Cienegas and work towards a more dynamic approach to brush management, recognizing that there is a give and take with this, that mesquites are these little islands of biodiversity. So you can get rid of mesquite, but then you introduce these monocultures of lamb and lovegrass. So mesquites through... Um, canopy cover, introduction of nutrients into the soil, and retention of moisture within the soil actually are more conducive now to cultivation of some of these native species on the rangeland. Once you remove them, then you change the entire composition of that range zone. So it's not necessarily that we've reverted back to a natural system. We still have a highly managed, highly regulated system that isn't necessarily natural or what it used to be. So going forward, trying to recognize all the inherent complexity within these systems, we are working to apply different methodologies. So there are new chemical compounds, different treatments, different applications that can be applied on you know, case specific bases. Um, also working with our grazing strategy, having it be more adaptive and dynamic, trying to work with mesquite, work around mesquite, but also figure out how to treat mesquite where we can have a balance between livestock production and um, you know, essentially a true rangeland versus these mesquite dominated systems. Ultimately then trying to figure out too what that means for wildlife habitat. So 
if we get rid of mesquite in its entirety, that might be a benefit for a select few species, but that's also going to have ripple effects for other species that are inherently reliant on the mesquite. So it's that cost benefit again. So looking towards some level of sustainability and balance, not trying to restore it to a completely open system, but figuring out how to work with mesquite in a way that makes sense. So that comes down to a statement of what your intended outcomes are. If you're working for wildlife habitat, maybe we're working on mesquite treatment for corridors and connectivity between these different open patches. Uh, maybe if it's for pronghorn, we do need a substantial area that is completely free or limited mesquite cover, for instance, or things like scale quail and mule deer and things of that nature. That's going to drive the approach to these different treatments. Um, at the end of the day, we're still looking at a multifaceted application. We can't just treat with, have chemical application. We can't just have grubbing. We can't just have fire. We need to have a multi-pronged approach that considers not just what the objective is for today, but where are we going to be 10 years from now and 25 years ago, or 25 years from now, and how are we going to keep up with that? How do we budget for that and build that in so we don't spend an extreme amount of time and money, walk away, hope that it's going to stick, and now we're back to the exact same ecosystem as we had prior to treatment. So those are some of the major drivers and considerations with all of this. And I know Scott and Julia have a lot more to say about all of that. I do want to leave you uh, with one last quote on this that I think is a good takeaway for the Santa Rita. And this is from Aldo Leopold that says, the science of land health needs, first of all, a base datum of normality or a picture of how a healthy land maintains itself as an organism. So if there is a takeaway from the Santa Rita experimental range, it's that there is no base datum of normality. It's not that we want to revert back to where we were in the late 1800s. That ship has sailed. The ecosystem has changed. The nature of all of this is how do we use what is now 120 years of continuous data to inform our decisions going forward? If we know that brush management is a tenuous process that has a variety of different outcomes, how do we use the data that we have to ensure our approach going forward is both going to be innovative and ideally effective, and we're not repeating the same mistakes of the past. So trying to harness this data between these three different watersheds and broadcasted information, hopefully will allow all of you to make more informed decisions about a variety of different treatment projects in your respective fields. So with that, I'm gonna jump off. Thanks again for my, <laughs> my lack of tech savvy in the beginning and happy to answer questions after this. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Brett, for a great presentation. We'll pass it on to Julia. Thanks everybody. Um, good morning, nice to see everyone. I am Julia Guglielmo, the Conservation and Science Director for the Altar Valley Conservation Alliance. Trying to share my slideshow. Okay, can everybody see this? I'll do a presenter view. Okay, so the Altar Valley. I'm not gonna go into too much history because Brett did a great job of talking about the history of brush encroachment into grasslands, but just a little bit orientation of what the Altar Valley is. It is directly southwest of Tucson. So if you drive down Highway 86 out of Tucson, Ajo Way, and then south of that is the Altar Valley. It stretches down to the US-Mexico border on the south. And then the Babo Kivri and Coyote Mountains border it on the west, the Sierrita Mountains on the east, and then Highway, two, Highway 86 on the north are kind of the boundaries. It's about 610,000 acres. Um, the grassland portion of the valley is extremely similar to the Santa Rita Experimental Range. It's really similar ecological sites. Um, the northern end of the valley is actually lower and it's more Sonoran desert scrub. So we kind of have a spectrum of vegetation communities in the Altar Valley that we're trying to manage. The Altar Valley Conservation Alliance is a watershed-based collaborative conservation organization founded in 1995 by landowners. So this is a rancher and agricultural operation driven organization that works to conserve the valley for future generations. So we work across landscapes, across different land ownerships that have different uh, management guidelines and requirements. So we're really trying to look at a truly landscape scale in the Altar Valley. So just a quick 
a snapshot in time. The Altar Valley, similar to the Santa Rita, um, used to be kind of a rolling grassland. There wasn't a true river that ran through the watershed at all. It was a giant floodplain. And water used to kind of sheet flow across the whole thing and soak into the soil slowly. Um, but mesquite started encroaching into the uplands and out of drainages um, in the early 1900s. And a lot of the washes in the Altar Valley have also become incised. The water table has lowered. And so there's a lot of questions about the dynamics of the mesquite tap roots being deep and maybe drawing up the groundwater and keeping that water table down, dehydrating those top layers of soil. Um, for other grasses, for the grasses and forbs beneath it. So there seems to be kind of a whole um, interaction between the hydrology and mesquite in the Altar Valley that it is of great interest to the landowners here. So methods that we're using currently and have used in the past. Um, grubbing is of course, when you pluck the entire tree out of the ground. We've found that benefits of grubbing have been the fact that, of course, it completely removes the tree, so it has the least chance of re-sprouting. Um, and you can do it at many times of year, so when you do the treatment is pretty flexible. The drawbacks are that it's really expensive per acre. Um, you need to decide how to handle the mesquite car carcasses. As I was mentioning earlier, what do you do with those huge brush piles? And you might need to obtain permits for ground disturbing activity that can be actually very prohibitive as far as costs of the project when you're not on federal lands, especially to do archaeological clearances to get the grubbing done. So successfully, um, we have followed this treatment up with more grubbing as well as backpack herbicide in the Altar Valley, those seems to be kind of the um, most common couples of treatment is grubbing with more grubbing or grubbing followed by herbicide. And then fire can be another good one. And of course, everyone wants to kind of restore the natural fire regime to the landscape. Um, and it can be really beneficial for the other species that you are trying to restore and can help encourage them to grow back. Um, fire can also be cheaper than other treatments. Um, but you do need to have exactly the right timing. And especially from a private land standpoint, again, it can be really hard to find an organization or agency that'll take on the liability for the fire. So that's kind of been our biggest obstacle with using fire, other than um, the right presence of fuels to carry the fire. We have followed um, fire up with grubbing in the Altar Valley. The Buenos Aires National Wildlife Refuge has done a little bit of that and we'll view that on the field trip. Mastication is one that has been used just a little bit. Um, Scott brought this up in his presentation. It's when you just cut the stump of the tree. A lot of times this is followed up with herbicide immediately. You cut it and then you put herbicide on. But there is an area in the Altar Valley where just the mastication was done and that grew back extremely quickly. So um, that's kind of a lesson learned that we're, I don't think a lot of organizations would recommend just cutting the stump. Herbicide has been, it's um, a little bit of a controversial topic because it can affect other species and a lot of people don't like using herbicide. In the Altar Valley, we've tried it um, aerially applied from a helicopter across a large area, as well as by backpack, a ground treatment of spraying it. Um, the benefits of herbicide, though, could be that, first of all, it doesn't have a lot of ground disturbance because you're just flying or walking over it, and it can be slightly less expensive than other methods. So our aerial treatment was about $89 an acre. Um, the effects on the surrounding environment are really important. Um, the ones that we've seen with the aerial treatment actually didn't... Um, affect the other surrounding species negatively, which was a huge um, relief for us. And then with the backpack herbicide spray, you can really target it very well. Um, there's chemicals that are pretty targeted for woody shrubs. So um, there are some out there that you can use and that we have used semi-successfully, but again, just like every other treatment, um, it really needs a lot of follow-up. So just wanted to highlight that in the Altar Valley, we're really managing across different land ownerships. 
And one area which we'll visit on the field trip is this brush treatment corridor project. Um, we're aiming to create and expand a corridor of improved habitat from east to west across the valley. So you can see in this map that on the east side is the Buenos Aires National Wildlife Refuge, which is federal land. And then it goes west onto the Santa Margarita Ranch, um, which is also on state land. It crosses the only major highway in the Altar Valley. We have a highway that runs um, north to south um, that is sometimes hard for wildlife to cross. Um, and um, the treatments in this corridor are aimed for multiple different goals. So on the ranch side, they're grazing it. It needs to be forage for livestock. And then on the refuge side, there is no grazing on the refuge. So they are mostly managing for the endangered mass bobwhite quail. There are also other wildlife that would use this grassland, such as pronghorn, which are on the slide. So really thinking about the specifics of your treatment with how many mosquito are left on the landscape, what kind of understory you're trying to encourage, um, the view shed that is allowed for species and humans, are recreationalists going to use this? All of that is kind of pushed into this one area and so we're really trying to make it into a multi-use corridor. Um, and it's been pretty successful so far. Um, one me metric of success has been that pronghorn, which were translocated onto the refuge side last year, have been successfully crossing the highway and using the grubbed areas on the Santa Margarita Ranch. So also wanted to highlight the monitoring that we're doing. Um, just the methods that we happen to be using right now. Um, for the herbicide treatment, the methods we used were photos, vegetation and frequency, vegetation frequency and composition using transects, line point intercept, um, live mesquite canopy cover, how much of it is green, um, aerial imagery with seeing the greenness of the overall area and the greenness of the woody vegetation versus herbaceous vegetation as a comparison. And we also um, put our monitoring data into a rangeland hydrology and erosion model um, to see if it was having any effect on the amount of soil that was retained on the landscape. So results we saw from that 2019 aerial herbicide treatment was that mesquite definitely lost leaf cover during the year. Um, they were definitely affected by the treatment and it was effective, but the understory vegetation has really varied from year to year. And it's hard to tell if it was rainfall or other variables that are affecting that. Um, and the model did not show that any extra soil was retained as a result of understory coming back. So. Um, the data and the numbers don't say a lot about what has come back um, after this aerial herbicide treatment. And then, of course, a lot of the trees have been recovering since that treatment. We followed it up with a targeted backpack herbicide treatment in one small area. And we have just been taking photos and live canopy cover measurements of those. And all the trees that are less than one inch diameter that were monitored with that double treatment have died um, since the backpack herbicide follow-up. And about half of the trees that are bigger are dead and all of them are seriously defoliated. So kind of the takeaway for us with the herbicide was that if we do follow up with multiple herbicide treatments, it can kill the mesquite, keep the understory and not negatively affect other vegetation, but we haven't studied what types of vegetation are actually growing back. Um, the uh, two other things we've been monitoring are a combination of grubbing and herbicide, as I was mentioning on the Santa Margarita Ranch. Um, so the grubbing happened about three years before the follow-up treatments, um, and the methods for that were photos and then presence of pronghorn. The results from that is that the trees are growing pretty quickly after the grubbing treatment. Um, the initial treatment was really effective, but the young trees are coming back and follow-up is needed pretty quickly within the first couple of years. But animals are using the habitat and it still is looking really good. So this grubbing and herbicide and herbicide herbicide 
are, I think, good examples in the Altar Valley where the landowners have been keeping up with the treatments very well and have had the results that they wanted to. And really the question is, can they keep that up and do you want to keep it up over many decades? And then with fire, we had one prescribed fire um, that was done in 2018 with no follow-up treatments. We established vegetation transects, haven't had the money to go back and do vegetation monitoring after that, but we do have aerial imagery and we've taken photos of the site. So the fire did successfully burn the mesquite. Vegetation seems to be growing back more green and more diverse than it was before just by ocular estimates. So um, just to kind of conclude on what we're doing in the Altar Valley is that we have a variety of treatments going on, a smorgasbord of monitoring methods, um, and we're trying to do kind of an analysis of what um, the results are of different treatments, as well as an analysis of whether it's kind of worth doing from a landowner perspective. And of course, the most important part of that is just talking with the different landowners and seeing what's worth it, seeing what they want to do, um, and how anybody can really support them in doing those treatments when we're talking about a large landscape scale objective. And then on the field trip for this workshop series, we'll go to sites um, the oldest treatment in the Altar Valley, I think, continuously happening has been backpack herbicide by Mary and Charlie Miller, who I think are on this webinar. Um, they've been uh, stewarding that land for many decades and have done an amazing job at keeping that land really nice. We'll look at the aerial herbicide treatment and then grubbing plus herbicide and then fire plus grubbing are the methods we'll look at. And then concepts we could discuss is how might the soil type have affected the treatment response? Like Scott and Brett were talking about, what about these sites um, might have affected what happened? What are the most important monitoring techniques to do, not just in the valley, but kind of across our area? What are the most valuable ones? And then also, what are the highest value treatment methods and locations? Um, and then just in the bigger picture, as Brett was mentioning, what does the extremely long-term care of these treatment areas look like? Is there a chance that they'll just get um, to the point where they need less and less maintenance over time? If we put them in the right places, would there be better chances of them being more self-sustaining? Um, these kind of bigger picture questions will be great to look at when we're out on the field trip. And that's it for the Altar Valley, thanks. Thank you so much, Julia. Great presentation. We'll pass it over to Scott Jones to hear about Las Cienegas National Conservation Area. So I'm going to introduce uh, the Las Cienegas National Conservation Area, which is about 45 miles southeast of Tucson. Um, it is a 45,000 acre working landscape. It's managed by the BLM um, and it's managed for multiple uses. So it has an active grazing uh, regiment that's going on across it. Um, it is also highly used for recreation, especially after COVID. Um, most campsites are mostly filled on the weekend. Um, and that's a diverse use group uh, from hunting to people training bird dogs uh, to wildlife watching and ecotourism. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, so it exists at about 400 millimeters mean annual precipitation. It's a little bit higher elevation than the Santa Rita and Altar Valley. And therefore, you tend to not see as high coverages of mesquite across the landscape. And encroachment, I believe, has been lagging behind a little bit what has seen um, at the Santa Rita and Altar Valley. It's also home to five of uh, the rarest plant communities, which include cottonwood, willow, sacatone, um, flats, and then mesquite bosques. It has something like 260 bird species and 60 mammal species, so it's highly biodiverse. Um, it is a bastion for some of uh, the grassland obligates that don't have habitat elsewhere. Um, and it has also gone, undergone, as these other areas, um, shrub encroachment and has an active brush management regimen going on to treat uh, said encroachment. I'll do a little shameless plug here. The Cienega Watershed Partnership uh, put together a free virtual tour of the watershed. So if you are planning on going out to visit uh, the La Cienegas during this workshop, um, I would encourage you to maybe download this free tour and listen to it. It starts as you turn off the 83 and gives you a big history of uh, 
of the watershed in general and a lot of good pieces written by like the late Tom Meissner um, as well as Ian Tomlinson who runs the Barrett Earl and also has allotments on there and Karen Sims, a number of people that have a deep knowledge of this area. I'll also pop that link into the, uh, the chat if anyone's interested. Anyway, I thought I'd start here with uh, looking at shrub cover change across this landscape. So here's La Cienegas um, in 1936, which is the oldest known um, aerial imagery that we have of it. And you're looking at shrub cover at 30 meters. And the cooler colors in the green represent low or no shrub cover. And as you get warmer into that reds and pinks, that's high shrub cover. So starting in 1936, most of the uplands are open and most of the shrub is contained along these washes, as Julia was mentioning, a similar situation in these loamy bottoms and clayton swales. Uh, to reference you, if you've been out there, the Empire Ranch is roughly in that area. So fast forward to 1975, and you can see a lot of these uplands have started to become encroached uh, by mesquite as they moved out of these lowland areas up into the uplands. Um, 2017, you can see more filling in and density has increased in a lot of areas. And you can start to see uh, in these locations uh, where brush management has started to been implemented to control shrub. Uh, fast forward in 2017, you can see some areas that were mostly open, like down in this little tip right here, is now mostly mesquite uh, woodland area. So stepping back to 2017, I want to look at this map and, you know, you start to really kind of notice shrub cover is not even across the landscape. So you have this area that's like heavily encroached and then down south you have an area that's in mostly resistant to shrub cover or shrub encroachment. If you were going out to the landscape, this is what you would see. You'd see one area right here predominantly dominated by mesquite, another area open. You know, it's important to remember this is in the same uh, precipitation range, so you wouldn't expect that to be driving that much of a difference um, in shrub cover percentages. And this gets into what Brett was talking about as you have these topoedaphics. So the topology of the location and the edaphics of the soil properties of that location um, are in part controlling where shrub is encroaching and the percent cover you would find on those locations. So I have a graph here. Um, I'll walk you through it a little bit. So each one of these dots down here for each one of these uh, barn whisker plots represents shrub cover classified at one hectare or 100 by 100 meter plot. Um, and then we have these red diamonds at the top, and that's our theoretical idea of shrub cover at 95th percentile. So 95% of the point should be below that point, and we assume that might be the maximum cover um, for that site. And then this is broken up by ecological site, which is a common tool used um, to group locations together by uh, similar topoedaphic properties. And you start to really notice there is extreme variability across the landscape on the amount of shrub that can be held or the maximum potential of shrub at each location. So across La Cienega, the maximum shrub potential we would estimate to be about 24%. But you get down to the loamy bottoms and you start to see about a 45% compared to other areas that have you know, less than 3% maximum potential shrub cover. Um, Sauter also noticed that there's a number of these points that have not reached up into this maximum potential that we have. And this builds a little bit more on to what uh, Brett was talking about, about how soil is a predominant driver. But we also have found out that there's a number of different topoedaphic variables uh, that dictate shrub cover across the landscape. So I won't get too much into this. Um, we did publish this paper. Uh, I will pop it in at the end of this, uh, entitled Topoedaphic Constraints on Woody Plant Cover in Semi-Arid Grassland. We looked at a number of different uh, topological and edaphic features, such as elevation, slope, bedrock, the water holding capability of an area, and then soil clay percent. And you really start to see that each one of these dictates the amount of shrub that can be found on you know, the maximum potential at a location. Uh, elevation I'd like to highlight here, this is really interesting. Um, in our site, it seems to have a very strong control over the amount of uh, shrub cover at a location. Uh, that southern half of the site is mostly at a higher elevation, and mesquite at this area is operating at about its elevational maximum, which is about 1,500 meters. Um, and we think and we hypothesize this is probably due to more frost days. That slight elevation change leads to colder temperatures, and it may be suppressing shrubs to an extent in that lower, uh, in that southern half of the field site, 
uh, on top of soil clay being higher as well. And this is an interesting perspective. If we assume temperatures will be increasing, you know, you may hypothesize that these areas may open up to being uh, more perceptive to shrub encroachment and, and maintaining higher levels of shrub. So again, I'll link that at the end of this talk if anyone's more interested in kind of diving into the weeds in this. So switching focus onto brush management at Las Cienegas. Uh, like the Santa Rita and Altar, there is a long history of brush management. A lot of that was done by the original ranching groups that were out there, ranching families uh, to increase forage production and combat the changing landscape that they saw. But more recently, this has been dictated by the 2003 resource management plan that the BLM put forward. And under that, they want to maintain mesquite to be less than 10% across Las Cienegas. And that's broken up into our uplands that are less than 5%. And then in the loamy bottoms, that can range from zero to 15%. Um, so from 2007 to 2016, I think this is a little outdated, goes into 2020, um, about 16,600 acres have been treated at Las Cienegas. And you'll see a number of those treatments over in this map here. Um, I'll highlight, kind of zoom in a little closer to each one of these treatments and describe it. Um, also important to note, just recently, uh, ecological assessment was passed that opens the door for BLM to use a diverse suit, uh, suitcase or toolbox of brush management tools um, at their disposal. So that was currently passed. So there's been a number of herbicide treatments in the location, uh, whether that be like cut stump. So what that means is you cut the, the mesquite down and then you either go over with a paintbrush or a sprayer and you apply applications of herbicide directly to that, comp, that uh, cut stump. Um, and then there's also been foliar spraying. So going around with backpack sprayers or ATVs and uh, covering the, the mesquite with herbicide in that regard. Um, so my understanding, a lot of those treatments haven't been as successful as they wanted them to be. Uh, where success has been seen is when you kind of have this basal bark spraying, where you find the young saplings or the re-sprout, and you're able to apply applications that way. Uh, reasoning that's a little bit easier to just kind of get someone out there with a, a uh, backpack sprayer to, to target uh, dispersal of that. It's a little bit harder when you have to bring out larger equipment to do that. Uh, Mechanical treatments has actually been probably one of the most widely used uh, treatment methods in that area. There has been some mastication. This is up just northeast of the uh, Empire Ranch, which you can see right here. Um, in this area, we call the airstrip. Uh, again, that area is heavily used, so I assume that retreatment is kind of constantly going on with this mastication. But I think the most uh, predominant use has been this grubbing, so taking out these large tractors uh, and physically removing the mesquite from the landscape. This is really good for large mesquite, and it also is, allows you to be pretty targeted with your treatment. So you're not spraying herbicide across the landscape. You're targeting these large mesquite and pulling them out, and you can kind of manufacture the landscape as you want. Again, while they're using rubber tires for this, which is uh, dictated by the EA, um, there is issues with taking a bunch of tractors out on the landscape. So here's a 2010 treatment. This is uh, the nape imagery just following that treatment. And you can see across the landscape, you can see the marks of taking that heavy equipment out there to grub out mesquite. And in subsequent years of photography, you can, you can start to still see those remnants of that. So this is important to think about with soil health. If you do this, pro this, uh, this management technique, and you get a lot of rain here, you've actually increased the potential for soil erosion in those locations. You also run into a situation of like, what do you do with all this material that you grub out of the landscape? Um, you can see here, you, these are what you commonly see after these, uh, these grubbing activities. And, you know, do you just leave them in slash piles like this across the landscape? Do you put them in wind fallows across, you know, long strips of the material? across the landscape, or do you pile them into one giant pile and maybe create some habitat for certain species uh, in that location? So this is something I think might be important to kind of consider as you're out on the landscape and you're seeing the results of these projects. Um, and again, there has been some prescribed burning in the area, uh, mostly through broadcast burning. And then through the new EA, there is this idea of using slash pile burns. So going out to those grubbed areas and then burning the material that's left over. Uh, the problem with uh, 
prescribed fire, even though it's the most cost effective, it is highly dependent on the climatic conditions that you have and the amount of fuel load you have to carry fire across the landscape. And as anyone knows, fire is also really not popular with surrounding communities. Uh, as you're driving out of Sonoida, you often see this sign that says grazing prevents blazing. Um, you know, considering these areas are constantly under threat of wildfires, going out and introducing manufactured prescribed burns across the landscape sometimes doesn't have the support that you want from the surrounding locations or surrounding communities. So going forward, um, so from that 2007-2016, Dan Quintana, who's been in charge of mostly doing these treatments, uh, has been trialing and airing a number of different process from herbicide to mechanical um, to, you know, these uh, integrated approaches by using multiple different treatment methods. Um, so from that, kind of learning from that, this new EA that was passed really allows for this flexible follow-up. And I, I believe, and it will follow up with him on the field site visit, but I think rubbing tends to be the most uh, viable option followed by herbicide application uh, within five years of the action. Um, and again, this new EA really is flexible for the follow-up treatments. It allows for it. Some of the things they've been having trouble with is they treated in 2010 some of these areas and haven't been able to get back in to do these retreatments. And here's, a, here's an example of this. So this is 10 years, taken in 2020, 10 years after uh, a uh, mechanical treatment in that area. And you can start to see that these shrubs are almost getting too big to go in and use uh, foliar or you know bark spraying herbicide applications. So hopefully under this new EA, this will allow for this dynamic follow-up treatments. And I guess this kind of gets into an idea too that Brett was touching on is how do these topoidaphic variables that I discussed before really affect and dictate the re-encroachment rates on these land landscapes? Not a lot of info is currently available within like the scientific literature for this, um, but we do have some kind of circumstantial evidence like what Brett presented. Here's a situation where you look at uh, a treatment in 20, or 1975, and you can see these green dots on the landscape are the remaining uh, mesquite. And then following 2010, you can see the re-encroachment rate, but it's really not at a large uh, density. I mean, you still maybe want to go in and treat this because you want to open it back up and maintain what you had, but the cost to do that retreatment, uh, you may be able to spread it out to a longer time frame. And uh, yeah, you won't have to have the manpower or cost to retreat a site like this. Now, if you go down to like a loamy bottom, so here's a agricultural field that was uh, used until about 1970s when it was abandoned and let uh, go to, re to basically just not used anymore. And you can see from 1975 to 2010, there is a substantially more uh, density of mesquite encroachment in the area. So, we assume that these topographic variables that are dictating encroachment onto the landscape and the maximum potential cover at certain locations are also dictating re-encroachment rates, which will influence how often and how you would retreat these sites. So with that, um, I will turn it over to questions for everyone at this point. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Julia, and thank you, Brett. A round of applause for our three presenters. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, we will we'll open it up for any questions from participants, folks who are, who are still here with us. Um, feel free to drop that, drop those questions in the chat or just unmute yourself and, and say them aloud. Um, this is a, the point at which we can uh, we can make this a little bit less formal. We encourage more conversation. And as we can see from the chat, we have a lot of experts in the room, people who have expertise in, in mesquite physiology and you know different, different subjects that are really relevant to our conversation today. So we might get really good answers from other people who are present with us today. It looks like there's um, a question here from Claire Taylor about what desired species are. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming maybe we can talk to that about, you know, what sort of grasses or other uh, other plants are, are desirable for ranchers or for uh, specific species of wildlife that are being uh, managed for on in the areas that Julia, Brett, and Scott discussed. 
Um, yeah, maybe I pass that to, to the presenters to see, is there sort of a desired species composition um, that y'all are, that, that you, you see people managing for? Yeah, I can just speak quickly. I think this really is dependent on what people want from the landscape and what you're targeting these treatments for. Like if you're strictly trying to maybe decrease bare ground and increase cover on the landscape, you wouldn't really care what grass is moving in on that area. But if you are targeting to increase grazing uh, or forage for livestock, you really want to make sure you're treating an area that you or reseeding with native seed to allow that. Um, you know, and this would also be if you're managing for biodiversity as well. It just depends really on what you're focusing on, what the site can maintain. Again, that history and that topoedaphic characteristic of each site really dictate what's on the landscape and what you can have on the landscape. Yeah, I um I would follow up on that similar approach that it's the answer everybody hates, but it it depends on what the objectives are. Um, I going back to highlight some of those photos that we looked at early on of an area where mesquite had been almost completely removed. Um, they really were much more of a monoculture of layman's love grass, and I think that's the takeaway from this is that the removal of mesquite doesn't necessarily indicate a healthier ecosystem. It's that it is a balance, but the balance is going to be based off of your own objectives of what what the intent of the ecosystem is. And so there's another question earlier in the chat talking about the removal of mesquite being that it is a native species. You know, why are we so focused on the, elimin the elimination of mesquite if it's not invasive? And there's not a good answer for that either other than it's an implicit recognition that where we are today with the density of mesquite is derived really from our own actions and a change in climate, climactic variables, et cetera. So all these multifaceted components that have led to these ecosystems that aren't necessarily balanced in the way that we would expect them. And we can't move forward and expect to return those ecosystems back to what they were 120, 150 years ago. It's then trying to recognize, are we trying to cultivate an area for pronghorn? If that's the case, then maybe we're content with the layman's monoculture that's devoid of mesquites. If we're trying to focus on increased biodiversity in general, maybe we have a more patchy or like mosaic approach where we have canopy structure for avian species and cover for wildlife, but still have the capacity to have livestock move in and out. Those mesquites then are an anchor for different native species and change the soil dynamics. Maybe the mesquites are gonna be on the soil so that way they affect the hydrology and surface flow. So it really just depends entirely on the nature of the project with the big picture takeaway being that mesquites in such a high density are not necessarily a natural phenomenon that we should expect. It is the product of a changing landscape for which we're largely responsible and, you know, in conjunction with a variety of other environmental covariates. So how do we work within those parameters? And I would add that as just a baseline reference for the species you might be aiming for are ecological site descriptions by the NRCS. So whatever land you're on, there's descriptions of the soil type and the vegetation communities that the land can support or that has been able to support over the last many decades. Um, so they'll tell you what species might be good, and I'll put a link in the chat to that. But one caveat to that is the future conditions and thinking about the future temperature, climate, precipitation regimes, and whether even aiming for that is possible or desired. But at least that's just one reference to say, hey, if we're aiming for a diverse plant community, that's kind of where we usually start. Just a final point on that. I think it is important to realize that grasslands and specifically semi-arid grasslands, which all three of these sites fall into, are some of the most threatened habitats that we have. So a lot of the biodiversity that is found there really doesn't have other places to migrate to. So um, this idea of maintaining open grasslands for grassland obligates, I would argue is an important aspect. And from that, you also get a ton of different ecosystem services that grasslands provide with that, whether that be like healthy, uh, you know, great or rangelands for grazing, or they're just, I think they're more aesthetically pleasing personally. So 
And then I did see uh, Richard Collins had a comment about cat call Acacia also invading. Um, I don't have too much experience with that. I do know the new EA that they passed uh, does expand the boundaries. They're able to use these management treatments. And I believe uh, cat call Acacia is accounted for in those uh, in that EA. So I'd assume some of the similar treatment methods would be applicable uh, towards cat call Acacia. Although I can't speak personally on it, I don't know too much about the species or its management. I will say that we do have a heart case study on cat claw um, uh, that happened at the Walnut Gulch Experimental Range that I'm posting a link for there that talks mainly about the interactions between removing cat claw and erosion. Um, one of the big questions that we've been thinking about and that a lot of people are thinking about in terms of um, what happens when we use these removal treatments and remove this mesquite from the landscape, the, the fragile soils of semi-arid regions are really underlying the health of these ecosystems and uh, can be very slow to recover. So if we're taking actions that uh, have significant impacts on soil erosion, we may want to reconsider uh, where and how we're treating for those. So a great case study um, from PrEP that I encourage y'all to, to check out. Um, I'll address uh, Anthony Collins' question as well on ecological site descriptions on a whole. Are they fairly representative of realistic site potential? Um, as far as I understand, these ecological site descriptions have been constantly evolving. Um, this is driven a lot through uh, the people out of the Hornada and uh, Joel Brown. Um, and I think they are getting more viable in those descriptions. And there's a really good site, it's called Edit, E-D-I-T, which uh, gives some very good background on what each one of those sites is and the state and transition models uh, associated with them. Thank you, Scott. And um, maybe we can take a moment also to, to open this up and ask people uh, who are on this webinar about, you know, after these presentations and hearing about these, both the, the sort of overview of brush management in Southern Arizona uh, from, a, from a really 3,000 foot, 30,000 foot uh, perspective, um, but also the more sort of focused and localized perspectives that we heard from our three presenters in these watersheds that they work in. What are some questions that remain that folks would like to explore in the field visits when we're, when we're out there together on the, on the land at the Santa Rita? Uh, in October, the Altar, Altar Valley in November, and um, at Las Cienegas in January. What are some of the questions that people have after hearing this information um, that they'd love to delve into uh, when we're together looking at the land? Ariel, this is Chris Pegg, and I just am really happy to hear this presentation. I think on these field trips, it would be really great to make sure that we incorporate the variability of the soils. Take a look. This seem, certainly seems like a, a ripe area for further work. Thank you, Chris. That's a great that's a great um, a great comment and a great question to explore because I know that some of the ecological sites have some soil maps that are fairly broad. Um, and as most folks know, when you actually get down on the ground, there can be a tremendous amount of variability, you know, one foot to the other. Um, and that is not always captured on, although the ecological site descriptions are a fantastic resource, I don't want to undermine that in any way. Um, they are meant for maybe a broader uh, perspective and a larger landscape perspective than some of these treatments are taken at, which is really, um, you know, tens or, or hundreds of acres. Thanks for that, Chris. Any other questions that folks would love to explore in the field? I think somebody is asking in the chat about ways to treat acacia 
And so maybe we can talk about that during the field trips. I also see some comments about species specific responses, like Mark Bell is talking about the shrub cover uh, thresholds that um, pronghorn will tolerate. Uh, that can certainly be something we talk about uh, in more depth in the field, especially when balancing with the needs of other species who might benefit from certain levels of shrub cover for refugia, like a quail or a certain bird species, or um, yeah, a number of species that use mesquite pods as food, cover, shelter. And I see other comments about soil composition. Uh, I will put a plug for the Santa Rita Experimental Range Workshop where we will be um, having, having some demonstrations about how to do uh, soil texture assessments. Um, we'll talk a lot about the effects of these treatments on the soil, how these soils affect the different treatments. That'll be a big focus of our conversations in the field. I'm looking forward to that. There's another question. Um about native people and indigenous knowledge too. Um, I, I'll address that one to the best of my ability. I think a lot of this is sort of an implicit recognition that A, there, there's increased engagement, at least on the Santa Rita. Um, so we're continuing to work in that fashion to incorporate principles of traditional ecological knowledge and tribal engagement um, regionally. And so that is a developing aspect and really is something that the Santa Rita has been lacking in terms of perspective. In terms of overall treatment, um, I know going back historically, the the level of mesquite that we see today was not what it was, you know, 150, 200 years ago, mesquite was not so ubiquitous on the landscape. And so the need for treatment, I think, was probably not there and not there to the same extent that I don't want to speculate on in, in terms of the types of treatments that may or may not have been applied. Um, but the saturation on the grasslands like we have, you know, traditional grasslands like we have today was not the norm um, going back, you know, decades and centuries. And so it's difficult for me to say whether or not there was any sort of active treatment, but going forward, making sure that we are a platform to incorporate you know, essentially, I, I guess what I'm getting at is <laughs> we, through our own um, application of livestock and technology and so on, um, we altered the landscape in a way that we didn't intend to, whereas prior to the application of livestock in such a high density and some of these climactic variables, the nature of that landscape was fundamentally different. And so, you know, positioning the Santa Rita in a way to be in more of a listening realm rather than driving this and learn from those traditional ecological principles, I think really opens up a, a broad swath of opportunity going forward. So um, that's not a very clear cut answer, but that's where we're at in terms of this process. Yeah, and to add to that real quick, I mean, obviously you can use the beans for food and use the wood for wood and building things. So. Um, it would be great to think beyond those uses and thinking how to use large volumes of trees for those uses. And as far as the Altar Valley goes, we border the Tohono Autumn Nation and partner with them pretty often on fire management and other things. So we will try to get a Tohono Autumn re um, representative to the field trip in the Altar Valley and get some of their perspectives as well. Uh, there was a question by Chris Craig. I don't know if I pronounced that right, about winners and losers. Um, I can speak a little bit on this. I have done some modeling on impacts of that shrub cover I change I showed in 1936 to 2017. So I modeled like habitat for pronghorn based solely on like visual impacts to them because they're highly receptive to things uh, messing up their line of sight. So uh, originally there was about 84% of like good high quality habitat across Los Angeles. And then by 2017, that's down to like 60%. And most of that is confined in that Southern portion that has not been encroached. Um, I've also looked at grassland and uh, facultative bird species as well. So you have things like uh, there's a grasshopper sparrow uh, that is has been shown to lose habitat most likely from this rub encroachment, but things like Cassian Sparrow may not be that impacted. 
with uh, other of these more facultative bird species like ash throated flycatcher, which would be increasing its habitat range as shrub. So it's these winners and losers. I think what's important to remember is that uh, a lot of the species that are losers tend to be these grassland obligates that already are stressed for habitat, a suitable habitat. Thank you. Thank you again to all our speakers and to everyone who joined us. We appreciate y'all spending the time with us today. Um, I'll post once more into the chat the link for the workshop series flyer. You can download that here. Um, and that has links, registration links for the Santa Rita Experimental Range coming up on October 20th, Altar Valley on November 3rd, and Las Cienegas on January 19th. Um, thank you again to our presenters. Thank you everybody for being with us today. Uh, and we'll follow up with the recording and link to the present presenters slides as well after the webinar. Thank you, everyone.